Hello! Welcome to Teach Me Maths. My name is Jonathan Hicks and we're doing Algebra! Finally! Now I've been waiting a long time for this. Algebra is probably my favourite topic in all of maths. Now you might be thinking, he's crazy! But there's a good reason for that. Algebra is it's like a puzzle that needs to be solved. It's a bit like watching a crime drama. So you might have some facts to hand, there are various lines of inquiry you can take to figure out who done it. But when it clicks, when you put the pieces of the puzzle together and you solve it and figure out what the solution is, it can be really satisfying. And dare I say it, fun. So let me try and explain in this video what algebra is. Over the next few videos I'm going to be showing you all the different tools that we need in algebra to solve the problems that get presented to us. And algebra does have a very practical application. I'll try and explain why we do algebra as well and why it can feel a little bit frustrating when we first start learning it. So what is algebra? Imagine I go to the shops and I buy four apples, let's say, and I don't pay any attention at the time to the individual price of an apple. But when I come out of the shop, my friend says, oh, I really fancy an apple. How much do they cost? And although I can't remember or didn't really notice how much an apple costs individually, I remembered that the total amount I had to pay was 84 pence, or cents, depending on which country you come from. So four times the unknown price of an apple is 84 cents. Now, my friend, now that he knows this, he can use that information to work out the price of an apple. So, obviously in this case, if four lots of this unknown number was 84, we can just divide it by four to find the price of an apple. So in this case, it's going to be 21 pence. Great. That is algebra. That's all it is. You set up a problem which involves an unknown number, and then you do a bit of messing around, in this case we divide it by four, to figure out what the unknown number is. And as I say, this has lots and lots of applications. There's all kinds of situations where this becomes very useful, which we'll talk about a bit later. But before we get onto that, just to talk about the question mark here, I've used a question mark to represent this unknown number, the price of an apple in this case. But that can get rather confusing. If I went into the shop on a different day and I bought three apples and I also bought two bananas and I don't know the prices of either of them or didn't pay attention to them and the total price turned out to be one pound and 94 pence or something. At this point it gets really confusing because these question marks represent different things. The price of an apple is not the same as the price of a banana. So ideally I want to use different symbols to represent the unknown numbers. And in theory you could use any symbol you like. You could use a star to represent the price of an apple and you could use a spiral to represent the price of a banana. It really doesn't matter. But for consistency and so that everyone understands the kind of symbols we use and also so we don't have to invent all kinds of crazy symbols, we tend to use letters. Partly because we've got a lot of them. You've got A and B and C and D and E and all the rest of them in the alphabet. So it's very easy to come up with different symbols because you just pick a different letter. So for example, I could pick T for the price of an apple and Q for the price of a banana. You could pick any letters you like, it really doesn't matter. The point is though, that whenever you see a letter in algebra, it just represents an unknown number. So although these look like letters, actually they're not letters. They're numbers. They're just numbers that we haven't figured out yet. And that really is the golden rule with algebra. Every time you see a letter, it's actually a number. So anything you can do to a number, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, you can also do to a letter. And we'll come on to that as we develop the different tools within algebra uh, over the next few videos. But there's one letter that we like more than any other letter, particularly if we've only got one unknown number. And that letter, as you've probably guessed, is X. However, there's a bit of a problem here, because if I say X is the unknown price of my apples that I bought, writing that is very confusing. Is that 4XX or 4 times X or 
it looks just like a time sign. So to avoid that confusion, there's two things that we do. First of all, we never write our x's like this. We always write what are called curly x's. It's a bit like a C with a backward C stuck to it on the other side. So you should get into the habit of always writing your x's like that. It's just to prevent you confusing it with a time sign. But there's a second thing we do to make absolutely sure we never confuse the x's with the time sign, and that is that we never write a time sign, or at least very rarely. The way you indicate that two things are multiplying each other, so if we've got four lots of the price of an apple, that's four times the unknown number x, you just write the two things next to each other. So 4x means four times whatever unknown number x turns out to be. And that's the second thing you really be, ought to be aware of when you're doing algebra. Anytime you see two things next to each other, it always means times. We never write the actual time symbol, you just stick the things next to each other. Knowing that will help you overcome a lot of the difficulties with algebra. So in this case, when we solve the problem, our unknown number x, the price of an apple, turned out to be 21 pence. All right, so that's kind of what algebra is. Let me just talk a little bit now about motivation. Why do we do algebra? When you first start learning algebra, uh, and in fact one of the first things I'll be doing in the videos over the next few weeks, is I'll be teaching you how to collect things together. So you'll have something like 3x, remember it means 3 times the unknown number x, it's 3 lots of whatever x turns out to be. And if we've got 3 lots of x, and we add 4 lots of x, you can collect these together, 3 lots of something plus 4 lots of something gives 7 lots of whatever that thing is. And you end up doing a lot of this kind of thing where you're collecting stuff together and expanding brackets and doing all sorts of things. And you sit there thinking, but why? Why am I doing this? What's the point? Now, this by itself has no point whatsoever. But it becomes very useful later on. But only when you put it in context does it actually make sense. It's like building a house. Imagine you had to build a house. Now if I just gave you all the tools, I give you a hammer and a saw and nails and all kinds of other tools, everything you need to build a house and say off you go, build a house. That would be a mammoth undertaking, particularly if you don't know how hammers and saws and other tools work in the first place. So if I want to teach you how to build a house, the first thing I need to do is to teach you how to use a hammer or use a saw. So if I give you a hammer and a nail and a random bit of wood, and say, okay, this is how it works, and you start tapping the hammer on the nail, and it goes into the wood. You're like, uh, okay, great, but what's the point of that? Well, there isn't really any point to hammering a nail into a piece of wood. You're just learning how to use the tool. You're learning how to use a hammer. But the point is, once you know how to use a hammer, and a saw, and a chisel, and all these other t uh, tools, you can build a house, or do something exciting with those tools. This is just a tool. By itself, there's no real point to it but you need to know how to do this in order to solve the really exciting problems, I think, that you come on to later in algebra. So you kind of have to suspend your disbelief to a certain extent for a while. Just treat this as an important thing you're going to need to know later. Okay, this is a hammer. I need to know how to use a hammer. Great, now I know, me. And now I know how to use it. I'll move on to something else. And once you know all the tools, you can do the really good stuff. So try and keep that in mind. Now, you might be wondering what the ultimate objective is. I talked about solving problems. Um, what you'll find is a lot of the time in science particularly, so things like physics or engineering especially, uh, to a certain extent in chemistry and even in biology sometimes as well, you have problems that need to be solved where there are unknown numbers. Uh, so this might be you're trying to fire a rocket into space and you want to make sure you've got enough fuel for it to get there. How much fuel do you need? It's an unknown number. And you can set up an algebra problem to solve that. And if you know how to solve algebra, you can solve it, figure out how much fuel you need, and then you can build your rocket. Woohoo! So that's the kind of problem you're likely to deal with. But the equations that they come up with can get quite complicated. So let me just give you an example. If I had some unknown number, remember, x divided by that unknown number plus 1, so this is a fraction line here. Remember, anything on the top of a fraction is divided by the thing on the bottom. And l let me tell you that that is going to be equal to the same unknown number minus 1. So an unknown number divided by the unknown number plus 1 equals the same unknown number minus 1. And the 
problem here is to figure out what the unknown number is. That's always what you're doing in algebra. You're trying to solve the equation, which means you're trying to find out what the unknown value of x is here. Now this is quite a tricky problem to solve, and it will take you a long time to learn all the different tools you need to solve something like this. But we start with the baby steps, we learn to solve simple problems first of all, and then we'll get on to the harder topics later on. I think that's an ice cream van. So, in order to solve this, as I say, we're going to develop a range of different tools. That's what we ought to be able to do first. And then we'll be able to solve these problems, which, as I say, might tell you how to put the right amount of fuel in your rocket or whatever it is. OK, now, a word of warning here. Algebra is a skill. It takes practice. You need to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And every time you do it, every time you try, you get better at it. But the frustrating thing is you often don't feel like you're getting better at it. And every time you try, you usually get it wrong. It's very much like doing a handstand. If you've ever tried learning how to do a handstand, they're hard. And you set up, I've actually been trying to learn how to do handstands over the past few months. And let me tell you, you get up there, you sort of throw yourself at the floor, and then you fall over. And so you pick yourself up, you do it again, and you fall over again. Every time you get up and do a handstand, it always ends with you falling over, pretty much. And it takes a long time before you can even get up to hold, maybe for a couple of seconds. But then one day it seems to click, and you manage to hold it for four or five seconds. You're like, yes, yes, I can do it. And then you fall over again. And then the next day you try it, and you can't even get up. Crash, crash, crash. You just keep falling over again and again and again. It's like, but I could do it yesterday. What's happened? And you'll find that your brain, while it's trying to get used to this skill that you're learning, will make some steps forward and then maybe a step back, and then a few more steps forward and maybe a step back. And it's hard to gauge your progress in that sense. It's the same with algebra. You'll do it and you'll get it wrong. And you'll do it again and you'll get it wrong. You've got to keep doing it though. The more you do it, the more you practice, the better you will get. And then one day it will click and you'll solve a problem all by yourself and you'll be like, yes, I can do this. And then the next day you'll get it wrong again. But keep going and you'll get there. Discipline and perseverance is a rare quality amongst people I find. But if you can master that, then you can master anything, including algebra. Now, just to point you in the right direction, there are three key areas of math that you need to know, and you need to know really well in order to be good at algebra. Those three areas are, first of all, think of these as the foundations of algebra, if you like, fractions. I'm afraid so. You need to be really good at fractions. They do crop up a lot in algebra. Secondly, negative numbers. That's the next thing. Again, they do appear a lot. A lot of people struggle with multiplying and dividing with negative numbers or adding and subtracting, but you need to be really solid on that. And the third thing, the last thing, is powers or indices. So squaring, cubing, things like that. So fractions, negative numbers, and indices or powers, those are the key foundational topics you need to be good at in order to be good at algebra. I find nine times out of ten, when somebody gets something wrong, when they make a mistake in algebra, it's not because they made a mistake with the algebra, it's because they made a mistake with their fractions, their negative numbers, or their indices. So focus on those, and it'll save you a lot of heartache. So as I say, I'm going to be doing a range of videos covering all the different tools you need, and then we'll build up to solving the big equations later on. So follow along with me if you want to learn how to do that. My name's Jonathan Hicks, and you're watching Teach Me Maths. Mm -hmm.